How about another joke, Murray? No, I think we've had enough of your jokes. What do you get? I don't think so. When you cross I think a mentally ill loner with a society that abandons him and beats him like trash! Call the police! I'll man. tell you what you get! Call the police! Get what you f***ing deserve! Last year, in one of his live streams, Nick Fuentes made an appeal to his audience with regards to public appearances. While he insisted that he personally isn't put off by unattractive people, he recognizes that politics is a vicious game, and appearances are everything. The Groiper image needs to be carefully managed, and when there are cameras around, Nick can only be seen with people who can't be ridiculed for the way they look. Or, in his words, Please, please, if you are fat or ugly, just stay away from the photographs. And generally, just stay away. I, it's not personal. I'm not that shallow. It's not that. It's just that if we ever have a picture of the Groypers, and it's a bunch of fat, ugly retards, we're all going to look like fat, ugly retards. People are going to say, oh, look, here come the Groypers, and they're going to post a picture of your fat, ugly face. You heard the man, audience of people who willingly self-identify as anonymous green blobs on the internet. Don't spoil this man's image in public by being unattractive. From then on, Fuentes would only ever be seen with the physical elites of America first. The pinnacles of... <laughs> traditional masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> this fucking guy! Oh god. After once again being shunned by the annual Conservative Political Action Conference, Nick and his little scamps decided to show up anyway. He was very quickly ejected from the building and then went on to hold an America First conference across the road, where he complained about the gross injustice of being kicked out of a private event that he wasn't invited to. He had also just been permanently banned from Twitter, a decision that he seems very confused by it. You know, it's so weird. I tell people I get banned from Twitter and they say, why? They give you a reason? And it's like, you know, they banned the sitting president of the United States from Twitter. They don't give you a reason. It's not like they have a good reason. Um, <clears throat> two minutes later. How many of you have seen a tweet that I put on Twitter and then I delete like 30 minutes later? Have you ever seen that? <laughs> I think like one time I tweeted, I said, I wish George Floyd would get exploded with the grenade. <laughs> I said, I wish there was a zombie apocalypse so we could sh kill George Floyd two times. <laughs> I mean, now that's definitely against the terms of service. But there was one thing he said at the event which was correct. The event he was ejected from was called Uncancelled and advertised as a response to big tech censorship. Fuentes correctly pointed out that none of the speakers at CPAC had actually been banned from any major platform, the one exception being Donald Trump. So at the very least, he's aware of the incredibly obvious fact that conservatives who go on international media circuits to complain about being silenced are not 
actually being silenced. Fuentes, on the other hand, is now banned from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, PayPal, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Airbnb, Southwest Airlines, TikTok, Reddit, Patreon, Coinbase, Discord, Streamlabs, DLive, Email Octopus, and Delta Airlines. So if anyone's being censored, it's this guy. He's a bit like Rosa Parks, really. If Rosa Parks ate her own snot and commanded an army of dribbling bedwetters who still need a note to get out of gym class, of course, some people have said he's also on a no-fly list, which would imply that he's currently on the federal government's terrorist screening center. Of course, this is just a rumor, for which the only proof he's given is a video interaction where he asks a Southwest representative if he's on a no-fly list, to which she says, I'm not sure. Which isn't proof, believe it or not. A much more plausible explanation would be that he was banned from a specific airline for unruly behavior. And I say this is more likely because he admitted it. I think I'm about to get kicked off my flight to PA because my mask isn't covering my nose. Yup, just got kicked off. Here's the best. I never refused to wear the mask, but the flight attendant had the plane go back to the gate and had me removed because of my attitude. Power trip! Exclamation point. I got up and looked him in the eyes and said, Hey, f you! He replies, Enjoy your time in Chicago. I said, Yeah, eat shit! <laughs> I can see why the no-fly list line was a bit more appealing. Unfortunately, getting kicked off of a flight for throwing your toys out of the pram isn't really going to give you the same political martyrdom as being suspected of domestic terrorism. However, Fuentes was labelled as a white supremacist podcaster by the FBI, who currently may or may not be investigating him over a $250,000 Bitcoin donation that was made to him ahead of the Capitol Hill riots. But in his conference where he complained about being censored, he also argued that being censored was really the best thing for him, because now he can say whatever he wants. The problem is, the only threshold left for Fuentes to cross is one that would lead to criminal charges. And he's already been dancing pretty close to that line. A typical Nick Fuentes maybe doing a crime clip consists of three steps. One, say some dumb shit that could potentially be illegal. Two, realize that what you're saying could be illegal, often whilst you're saying it. And three, say the opposite of what you said at step one. Let's look at some examples. Why do we just get no leverage? What are we going to do? What can you and I do to a state legislature besides kill it? Although we should not do that. I'm not advising that, but I mean, what else can you do, right? So that was filmed a couple of days before the Capitol Hill riot, where he was referring to the state legislators who were refusing to overturn the 2020 election. One of those legislators was Mike Pence, who the Capitol Hill rioters were calling to hang. And then we can look at what he said to his followers who entered the Capitol building on January 6th. George Groypington says, so good to see you back up and running. Nick, keep on keeping on. Also to the audience, if you had your phone on you inside the Capitol, destroy it or get rid of it. Feds are using the data. I think it would be too late, honestly. They probably have it all. But as a precaution, yeah, probably destroy your phone, your SIM card, all that information. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Is that, is that legal to say? <laughs> Maybe don't do that. Actually, can I say that? Don't destroy... Don't destroy evidence. Don't destroy... I don't know, is that a crime to say? I feel like what's happening here is obvious that I shouldn't need to explain it, but given the demographic we're trying to reach, here it is. In the US, they have something called the Brandenburg Test, which is used to determine whether or not inflammatory speech is being used to advocate for illegal action. In both of those clips, Fuentes does end by advising his followers against illegal action, but... The Brandenburg test doesn't require the incitement to be an explicit statement. The two elements that do need to be met are 1. The speech is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action, and 2. The speech is likely to incite or produce such action. So, if you tell people who entered the capital to destroy their phones, then walk back on it when you've realized that what you're saying might be illegal, what kind of action is your speech directed to incite? because you have told people that it's in their interest to destroy their phones, but just that it's not in your interest to tell them that. 
This technique is essential to the way Fuentes makes his points. Everything he says is just a meme and also deadly serious at the same time. Take the infamous cookie monster question, which Fuentes uses as an analogy for Holocaust denial. The math doesn't seem to add up there. The math doesn't quite seem to add up there. I don't think you'd result uh, in six million, maybe 200 to 300,000 cookies. And I think the Red Cookie Association said something like that, probably 200 to 300,000 cookies baked, probably. And in addition, you know, in this hypothetical, I imagine that if you took aerial photographs over the kitchens, you would need to see certain smokestacks to release the smoke from baking the cookies. And the smokestacks would project certain shadows, but I guess they're not visible in the aerial photographs taken over the kitchens. Moreover, if you look at the soil texture, it's really not deep enough for mass cookie storage underground. Um, and so there's a lot of things, you know, in the cookie kitchen, they say that the ovens are uh, wooden and they have windows on them and they're not totally secure. And the ovens that they use, they, they actually did sort of an ad hoc use of that particular kind of oven, even though they made a perfectly good design for ovens for a different purpose, for delousing. He dragged this out for a very long time, but you get the idea. Now, he's always insisted that this was just a joke and that he's not really a denier, but with just a bit of pushing, he'll end up saying things like this. So, you know, I, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff that's clearly like, you know, atrocity propaganda. You see this in any war, in any time, there's atrocity propaganda where they try and really make it heavy handed to, to guilt people and to, you know, bring down the hammer on the, uh, you know, transgressing country. But obviously I'm against, you know, genocide or human experimentation. I mean, I'm against things that are evil, but I, I you know, like every Holocaust survivor said that they were uh, experimented on by Mengele, <laughs> like every single one, the, the Nazi doctor. And it's like, definitely he existed and definitely did terrible things, but not every one of them saw that guy. Like, you know, clearly, <laughs> clearly there's some fibbing going on, so. Now, I don't know who needs to hear this, but saying the Holocaust happened and then following up with a rapid fire of claims accusing Jewish people of exaggerating what happened to them to meet a political goal is Holocaust denial. Like it's literally in the definition. If you really believe that every single Holocaust survivor claimed to have been experimented on by Joseph Mengele, then you're kind of definitely calling almost every single Holocaust survivor a liar. But who am I trying to convince here? These people weren't reeled into this movement because some bogey-eating shitbag said that some niche aspects of the Holocaust sounded silly to him. They don't care about facts. What they really care about, above everything else, is community. And nothing says it more than the inane grinning of people who are finally getting to feel as if they're part of something for the first time in their life. Yes, it's easy to poke fun at people who look like they still need to hide their lunch money in a secret stash. There's a stark resemblance to the old 4chan meetups where the edgiest, most controversial shitslingers on the internet turned out to be exactly the kind of mediocre slobs everyone expected them to be. But the thing is, there's nothing wrong with looking like this. I mean, the pit vipers are not really my thing, but looking like this doesn't make you any less of a man in my eyes, which is weird because it absolutely does to them. There's a moment in the CPAP building where these guys notice a left-wing journalist and decide to groip him. I'm the groiper. Hey, hey, is that Zach Petrizzo? Boom! <laughs> Really? 
These people are making fun of someone else for having a voice break. These people are berating someone else's masculinity. But really, it makes perfect sense. Often, this is just what happens when victims of bullying find themselves in a position of power over someone, especially someone who reminds them of everything they hate about themselves. Because whether it's Hitler getting rejected from art school, the leader of the 9-11 attacks getting surpassed by his two elder sisters, the Oklahoma bomber being rejected by the special forces, or even our own Nick Fuentes who, allegedly, shot himself running the mile in high school, the backstory for all of these people is one of emasculation and humiliation. There's a very popular YouTube video called What Pretending to be Crazy Looks Like, which features the Parkland school shooter trying to feign insanity during his interrogation. The act is extremely weak, but there is one place where Cruz slips up that might not be completely obvious. One of the key indicators of homicidal insanity is a lack of motive, and here, Cruz seems to compromise himself without even noticing. At one point, he tells the interrogator about how he had a fight with one of his classmates over a girl and lost. And that's it. That was all they needed to start establishing a motive. Now, I don't think any of these wallopers are going to end up killing anyone. Well, maybe you will, Timothy. I see you there, you ravenous testosteroid. We all know your mother drove you to this event, but that doesn't mean you can't still be a badass mother This is really f***ing weird. Why is this guy here? He should be at school, learning how to use the urinals without pulling his trousers all the way down. Pal! Mate! This will never end well for you. I know the whole white supremacist journey always starts with some kind of trauma or humiliation and of course you're going to fall into a movement that promises to reclaim western civilization or reclaim your masculinity or make America great again. It must be really cathartic to huddle around this guy and finally be the one doing the bullying, to finally let someone else feel your pain and all that Mickey Mouse bullshit. But you and Fuentes don't have the same interests. This is his job. And he's going to be doing this until he either ends up in jail or just fades into irrelevancy like all the other ones did. I mean, he could become president one day, sure, but who knows. But unless that happens, everyone else here is just kind of slowly ruining their lives. It's okay for Fuentes to be seen on camera doing this, but for everyone else, this could f*** their chances at college, it could f*** their future relationships, it could f*** their job prospects, and Fuentes doesn't care. He knows a lot of the kids in his movement will grow out of it, but it doesn't matter because he'll just find new people. And all the radioactive levels of cringe shouldn't distract anyone from the fact that these are literal children who are being ideologically groomed by a hate group. And if you're one of those people who have gone through life feeling rejected or lonely or unfulfilled, it's worth knowing that you were targeted for that. People buy things that they don't have. When a movement is selling an image of exceptionalism and strength, their design is to attract patrons who are unexceptional and weak. According to the research, whether it's the old skinheads or the suited up dweebs of the alt-right, people who leave these groups always say that they started questioning the movement long before they made the exit. The main thing that held them back was the fear that they would have nowhere else to go. Many of them are led to believe that society will never forgive them. And unfortunately, there might be a few too many people on my side of the aisle making sure that that feeling is justified. And I'm not saying anyone has to welcome a bunch of bi-curious fascists into their life, but it should be worth understanding that there's a difference between people who can be changed and people like Fuentes, who will probably be doing this for the rest of their lives. There's a documentary called Healing From Hate that really helps with understanding these movements, as well as how to get out. And I know you gripers all have access to your mother's Amazon Prime account, so you should take a look. If for nothing else than for a change of scenery from that stupid f***ing green screen background. Or, if you want, you can just carry on thinking that this is what saving America looks like and that these are the kinds of people who built ancient Rome. And in that case, I'll just leave you and the pipe-hitting Antifa guys to figure it out amongst yourselves. And until then, let's flipping go.